very recently a previously unknown fact has come to light. Lord Christopher Monckton is indeed a climate scientist. While his journalism and history training are well known and his impact in both fields have revolutionized humanity, it has only been revealed in the past few days that he undertook a double degree in climatology and alchemy at the University of Brillania. With his powerhouse of training, the talented man first turned his attention on an idea that had dawned on him as an undergrad. The failing of traditional alchemists were their focus on transmutation of materials into noble metals. How about applying the same techniques on crystalline forms of carbon? His experiments with carbon uncovered startling truths. First, the crystalline patterns of carbon that he used, as it was understood, provided mathematical foundations for what would become the eternity puzzle. By a slight change to the equation, the puzzle should become unsolvable, or at least require a very long time to solve. Yet, as we all know, this wasn't the case. The first eternity puzzle was solved far quicker than Moncton thought possible. Frustrated, the budding genius went back to the drawing boards. Something must be wrong with how we understood the properties of carbon. This would lead to, arguably, his most amazing revelation. However, before this realization occurred, Christopher unfortunately fell ill and retreated from the public line. Continuing his research over this time proved immensely valuable. An amazing outcome occurred. Further research into the properties of carbon, Moncton discovered the fabled elixir of life. In his own words, then, 18 months ago, I cured myself with uh, an invention which shows much promise. We're curing people of everything from HIV to malaria to um, multiple sclerosis. I mean, quite extraordinary. It sounds barking mad when you say it like that, but this appears to have a radical capability to cure people. It certainly cured me of 25 years of quite nasty illness. Of course, with his training in history and journalism, he was well aware of the threat to his rightful earnings and the possibility of the rise of socialism if he didn't protect his invention to ensure that it didn't become a free-for-all. Given a new lease on life, a startling discovery about the true nature of methane and carbon dioxide finally bloomed. Understanding the true nature of carbon, as only the good lord did, neither methane or carbon dioxide could have a significant role as a greenhouse gas. This converted him from a believer of anthropogenic climate change to a position that shook the world. He first tried to bring this revelation to his peers in the science community, only to face ridicule. <laughs> Realizing the peril the free world was facing if it chose to decarbonize its activities, he set out on the road to get his message out. About this time, a thought hit him. While there was no doubt he was a genius, his skills were not unique. Surely, someone else had come up with the same conclusion, or realized the true nature of carbon before him. So with his skills in history and investigative journalism, he went about exploring this thought. Just like Alice, the further he looked, the deeper and more insane the rabbit hole became. The socialists were hedging their bets from the very beginning, and realized soon after World War II that the red may not pay off. As a safety net, the red began investing in the green, that is, environmentalism. If people wouldn't buy equality as a guise to undermine personal freedom, the socialists would scaremonger them into fearing the loss of life as they knew it, through nonsense about the loss of species and environments. As a failsafe, if the green indeed didn't pay off, these socialists had even prepared a young African boy to one day move into the White House to steer the last remaining superpower towards their secret objectives. This was a move which required a puzzle of lies as detailed as Moncton's eternity puzzle. So with his wide-reaching skills and experiences, he was the man to discover this. And my purpose in being here is to have a further look at the question of whether the President of the United States is the President of the United States. Now, you may say, what has this got to do with somebody from Britain? And the first thing is, I'm not going to tell you whether the President of the United States is the President of the United States. It's not for me, as a non-expert in that, to make any pronouncement at all. I'm here because I am curious. As a peer of the realm, I'm allowed to stick my long aristocratic nose into anything I want to stick it into. I'm looking at another question which has simply come to interest me which is the question of whether or not the document that appears on the White House website at whitehouse.gov, you can go and look it up, is the real birth certificate for President Obama. Instead, it was a document fabricated piece by piece using either Adobe Illustrator or Photoshop uh, on a computer. Safe to say then that once you viewed the evidence, once you met 
Sheriff Arpaio, met Mike Zulo, who is Sheriff Arpaio's lead investigator, you were fairly convinced or at least satisfied that there was something here that, that was worth, in fact, investigating. That's right. I cannot say, not being an expert, that it is definite that there's something wrong with this document. What I can say is that when I heard the evidence, I went out and spoke myself to two experts in the forging of documents, one of whom I asked to forge a birth certificate for me. Not, of course, to forge it, because it had the large word specimen stamped across it so that nobody <laughs> could, could believe that it's genuine. But I wanted to see how one would go about creating such a document. So a, an American birth certificate for Lord Hawaiian birth certificate. There you go. And finally, on this point, uh, having seen that expert, I also consulted another, another expert who said there were 17 red flags, 17 questionable items to do with that birth. And this man had 20 years of experience. It's very Sorry. important that you should not get in touch with the posse yourselves directly. They are inundated with public inquiries. Please don't do that. Send them some money, by all means, that will help. Let but them don't do communicate with them because there's too many people doing that as it is. Just send them some money, keep it to that. Thank you. Amazed by what he'd found, Moncton tried to tell the world about time traveling US politics that resulted from Rachel Carson's green book, Silent Springs. However, the real insult came when a young hotshot, John Abraham, went out to make a name for himself by creating a video online which did nothing more than point to reality as it was typically understood, which was at stark contrast to the real reality that Lord Monckton had finally discovered. It was a move that won the young man credit and opened the door for further insult, the worst of which was the unanswerable smear provided by Peter Hadfield in a series of YouTube videos. But the results were quite extraordinary because I discovered that the person who can best debunk Christopher Monckton is Christopher Monckton himself. Monckton realized he couldn't get people out of their box. He also realized that responding to Hadfield would only discredit the truth and himself further. So regrettably, he had to bite his lip and ignore the challenge. But it wasn't all bad. Another genius, Anthony Watts, stood by the ailing lord. Other perks included a pin offered in lieu of his rightfully deserved Nobel Prize inclusion for his valuable contribution to climate science. Yet the road has been hard for the dedicated, brilliant mind. His venture around the globe to teach the world the accuracies of climate science has been long and exhausting. He has shown versatility and fashion finesse that has created a whole movement in its wake. He will venture on. He will continue to fight the good fight.